Hello and welcome. My name is Megan McGuire Steele, and I graduated from WashU in 2002 with a BFA in painting and minors in business and art history, and from Rhode Island School of Design in 2005 with an MFA in painting. I'm the owner and founder of McGuire Steele, a public relations agency based in New York City. And on behalf of the WashU Alumni Association, I'm excited to welcome you to this evening's panel, The Business of Art. We're live and in person at 11 Howard, and also we are live streaming via Zoom and YouTube to over 200 alumni, parents, and friends around the world. <laughs> um, thank you to everyone who already submitted questions via the registration process. We also encourage you, if you're watching online via the live stream, to post questions in the Q&A box, which uh, Suzanne will relay to me. Uh, we'll try to answer as many questions as we can that fall within our area of expertise. Um, and we'll also take qu questions from the live audience at the end of the panel. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted to the Alumni Association YouTube channel following the event, so you can also watch it post-event. And now it's my pleasure to introduce you to our panelists. Um, first on my left, James Cohan of James Cohan Gallery, Wash U Bachelor of Arts 82. James Cohan has been active in the contemporary art world for nearly four decades as a curator, advisor, and art dealer. Having worked for prominent galleries in New York and London for 17 years, Jim has represented a prestigious roster of living artists and artist estates. He has sold many important works to art museums in Europe, the US, and Asia. In 1999, together with his wife, James, they opened James Cohan Gallery on West 57th Street. Since its founding, James Cohan has presented a rigorous and varied program, including solo exhibitions of gallery artists and thematic group exhibitions each year. The gallery moved to Chelsea in 2002 and also had an outpost in Shanghai for eight years during 2007 to 2015. James Cohan Gallery has since relocated to Tribeca and opened two locations at 48 and 52 Walker Street. Jim is the chairman of the board of Art 21 and serves on the board of advisors to the Brooklyn Museum. He was also recently appointed president of the Art Dealers Association of America Foundation. Welcome, Jim. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and then at the uh, end of the panel, we have Karen Dector of Frankfurt, Kernick, Klein, and Seltz, Wash U, Bachelor of Art 02. Karen is a partner in the litigation group focusing on commercial and intellectual property litigation and white collar defense, named to benchmark litigations 2019 and 2021 40 and under hot list and listed as a 2022 super lawyer by Super Lawyers Magazine, Mrs. Dector advises clients in the art, consumer goods, advertising, and media and entertainment industries on business divorces, contract, fraud, copyright, trademark, false advertising, ADA compliance, and other matters. She's represented artists, galleries, and collectors in disputes over the Title II and on authenticity of artwork and in their business arrangements with others in the art world. She also advises art galleries on the day-to-day -day legal issues that impact their business. Welcome, Karen. And then in the center, we have Lucas Page of Page NYC, Wash U BFA 2014. Lucas Page is the owner of Page NYC, a contemporary art gallery in Tribeca, founded in 2016. The program shares a distinct focus on emerging painting worldwide, presenting an eclectic array of talented and in-demand young international artists. Exhibitions of Page have been covered in the New York Times, Art Forum, the Brooklyn Rail, Artnet News, among other publications. The gallery also produces and designs original artist books to accompany many of its shows. Lucas is also a director at Petzl Gallery, where he works primarily in sales, digital content, and art fairs. Last September, Lucas organized Page NYC at Petzl, a collaboration with Friedrich Petzl. This was the first time that Petzl invited a local gallery to curate a show in one of its spaces. Welcome, Lucas. Okay, so now on to the questions. <laughs> um, so some of the, you know, there were questions submitted online and some that we sort of 
uh, put together in advance. My thought for this panel was that, unlike a lot of other industries, um, there's no real roadmap when you graduate with your BFA and MFA as to how to enter the art world and navigate it. There's not necessarily a clear trajectory. And so I really wanted to do a, ba a panel that talked about you know, the ins and outs of the art world, the sort of basics of the ecosystem, and also the different considerations at different stages of one's career, whether that's being an artist directly, a gallerist, you know, just all the aspects that frame how the business of art is done and how that allows people to continue to pursue their creative endeavors. Um, so one of the first questions was you know, for the gallerists, what is your advice to artists in terms of how they should approach galleries for representation? A related question also submitted by a registrar. How do, how does or should an artist go about seeking gallery representation? And I think in turn, how does the gallery go about determining which artists it will sign and at what stage of their career? And then, so Lucas and Jim, I'd like you to address that. And then Karen can also speak to the process of consigning one's work, whether it's an artist consigning directly to the gallery prior to representation, whether it be for a group show or once they're actually engaging with the gallery in a more, more long-term working relationship. So Jim, why don't you, you tackle it first? <laughs> uh, it's, it's a lot, thank you very much. And it's wonderful to be here. <clears throat> That's a lot of questions all in one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I suspect um, from the artist's point of view, uh, it, it, is, um, it boggles my mind to understand that uh, there are probably well over two, 300,000 artists in New York City alone, all aspiring to have galleries and if you do the math um <clears throat> say there are 400 galleries and there are 20 artists per gallery and that's making the unfair assumption that they're all from new york there are a lot of artists who are really you know doing other things in order to make a living um so um the kind of vulnerability that exists in the artist community is super intense and um when I first got into the art world in, the, in 1982, I worked on 57th Street and there was a gallery called Alan Frumpkin and he was on the second floor of 50 West 57th and he did an open call to look at artist slides every Monday morning. And that is so far from where we are today. <laughs> uh, but it was, you know, a model that really um, stuck with me. Um, I think so often artists approach the gallery um, without really even understanding what we do or who we are. And if someone had half a sense, they would look at the website of the dealer and they would understand this is the kind of generational artists that w they work with. Um, uh, this is the sort of aesthetic approach that seems to be a commonality with my work. Uh, so, you know, being informed and aligning yourself with, um, you know, kindred spirits, I think is first and foremost. Um, the day of dropping off slides is well past. Um, and because uh, one of my first jobs was returning slides to artists. <laughs> with you know sort of nice notes um that were kind of vaguely hopeful um so uh we generally it has never been the case that an artist has approached us randomly that we have ended up showing them and it's probably based on the fact that during the day we're so preoccupied with all the activities of our day-to-day -day procedure of, you know, working, running the, running the gallery, working for our artists, doing all that. Um, it, it, for us, we represent artists who are not just starting off. They tend to be, you know, having had several shows with younger galleries. Um, and we're very good at bringing them to that next place. Um, and so in that way, we kind of consider ourselves a boutique. So. I think. Yeah, I mean, I think representation is a tough question for me. Um, as a younger gallery, I'm kind of in between representing a sort of small core group of artists and presenting kind of discrete projects and sort of the beginning of a relationship with someone. Um, so 
like Jim said, representation for an emerging artist is, you know, representation kind of comes with the territory, so to speak. I mean, I think it's a question that kind of develops with more time, although now I think that timeline is more and more condensed from, you know, my gallery to your gallery. I think that uh, is sort of, that's a new thing where I think bigger galleries are looking at younger artists. Um, but really, um, you know, I think like you said, the kind of community or group that you're associating with is a sort of a, a really strong start. I think your, your colleagues, artists that you associate yourself with are the ones that can kind of build you a foundation maybe faster than say approaching a gallery, which I guess is what we're talking about. Um, so for example, I really listen to the artists that I've shown um, and if they like someone, I will pay attention. Uh, if there's, you know, it's a cold call, an email, I'll, I'll maybe have a glance, but it's just not, you know, I don't know if that's... Will, will you go to a studio visit based on, like a lot, I, a lot of galleries say that they discover the next artist that they're going to work with, especially at your stage, based on their current artists telling them about, you know, friends of work that they love. Will you go and do a studio visit? Like if Lee Rubel, for example, who you work with said, Lucas, uh, I want you to go check out so-and-so's work. Or even if it wasn't that direct, she just was raving about how she saw their work and liked it. Would you go do a visit or how Ab would you go about Absolutely. It? I take that very seriously. I mean, if, if an artist approaches me and, and they're like, this is someone to really pay attention to, um, that is, I would say, you know, a, a real spark. So I think, uh, I guess, advice-wise, kind of building a group that you really uh, see yourself, you see your work sort of situated with, and then also kind of what, what James was, was touching on, uh, thinking really hard about what gallery or, or, you know, where you want your work to be placed. I think there's many kind of roads into the art world, and th you really kind of want to think about the best context and maybe targeting a certain program that, that seems like a good fit is a good start. So another question, um, I know also oftentimes a gallery will perhaps have someone's work in a group show or they'll sometimes do a first show with them before they commit to a full-time exclusive representation of the artist. And I think that's kind of a good point for Karen to kind of talk about like how what sort of agreements the artist should make when once they have gallery representation the gallery is of course handling the consignment forms and commissions and all those business aspects um, and I think when the artist is on their own oftentimes they don't necessarily know how to paper a deal or what they should be looking out for just to be professional and buttoned up and advocate for themselves initially so I think that's a great point for you to weigh in a bit sure so it will be the gallery that will be supplying the paperwork and the artist will receive it and review it. And I've dealt, I've represented small galleries that are just starting out and we're drafting their form consignment agreements and representation agreements from scratch. And I've represented well-established galleries where, you know, an artist will approach them about negotiating certain provisions. So, I mean, I think half of my practice is advising and counseling and the other half of my practice is litigation so i appreciate the need to have transparency and try and envision what might be down the road and craft agreements that have termination provisions when can you get out of the agreement if you want to get out of the agreement i mean there's the obvious provisions that are going to be in any agreement, like what is the commission and what is the duration and what are the works being consigned? Um, but what are the inspection rights? What happens when something is damaged in transit? What happens if someone is not marketing your work and putting in the effort that you feel should it be given? What grounds do you have to get out of that? Should you be looking for an exclusive? Should it be limited in geographic scope? Sort of what are the parameters to the relationship? Because it's a probably one of the most, if not the most important business relationship you'll have as an artist when you're trying to um, get yourself out there into the next level. And so, you know, the gallery may have legal representation, may not, depending on the gallery, but it, 
I would encourage you um, if, you know, th there's a wonderful organization, Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts, especially for artists starting out who might not have the money to go out and hire a lawyer. Maybe you have a relative who's a lawyer. Um, I don't know whether they have any familiarity with these types of agreements, but I would strongly encourage um, when you're starting out to keep that organization in the back of your mind, because it's so important for you as an artist to understand what you're entering into, to ask the questions, to know what the expectations are, so that there aren't mis, you could prevent certain misunderstandings down the road. So one of the other questions um, which we touched upon is talking about the importance of, from the gallery's perspective, of your program and having an overarching program that guides your decision making, the artists that you work with. And so I wanted to see if you could both speak to a little bit more about how that folds into your decision making and how, what ultimately you feel your role is in terms of guiding the artists that you represent. Um. First of all, I'd like to have Karen as my lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> She's good. She's good. Fine. Sign me up. <laughs> uh, you, you know, but it's often the case that with, with, it's sort of cliche, but um, the best relationship is the relationship where you never have to refer to those documents, right? And there's like a kind of trust and an understanding that this person is honorable and they have. Um, uh, uh, maintained a certain uh, moral standard and uh, more times than not you can ask around and you will find out because those who have wronged people are quite obviously you know made that's known to the world um, uh, in terms of our program and 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 what, what we uh, because you're representing artists that are more established, you're an established gallery representing artists that are more established in their careers. And so I think some of the considerations are placement in institutional collections, um, you know, what art fairs you're doing, international visibility. So. Thank you. So I would say that um, every artist that we work with, I want to believe that um, when I travel around the country and my colleagues and my partners travel around the country, that we can go to any museum and with great pride present that work to that museum and say, this belongs in the collection. And um, that has always been a kind of guiding principle for us uh, to believe that this is part of a bigger cultural dialogue um, and that there are a variety of touchstones that um, makes sense as sort of call it teachable moments for um, museums. Um, and uh, it's been a long time that I've been doing this. And um, when I first started, I was working for young, er, established galleries and um, working with curators and watching how the curators would introduce the gallery to collectors. And there was a kind of symbiotic relationship that always seemed to you know, jive. So um, that has been our touchstone. Um, in terms of content, uh, I used to say that we're interested in the human condition, but I was told that was like ridiculous. Oh, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and far too earnest. Uh, I like it. But you know, I I I think uh, there's there's certain artists that have had a huge impact on us, and um, and that we were early on to represent, like the estate of Robert Smithson, or uh, the work of Bill Viola, a video artist who's very involved in like looking at those sort of existential questions through new media, or someone like Fred Tomaselli, who on the other hand is using um, uh, repurposing drugs and putting them in the work and it's psychedelia and, and it's sort of changing the use value of drugs to create a window into another reality. So that's the broad spectrum. Amazing. And Lucas, what are you looking for and at these days as you continue to build your program? Um, yeah, the program is sort of the thing for me uh, in terms of like what, what am I trying to project? What kind of artists am I wanting to put uh, in conversation with one another um, and really thinking about this sort of like fabric uh, of a you know of a year of two years uh, it, it gets really exciting when 
you know, I think about a show coming up and then what's before and after that and the kind of friction or tension that can arise between artists. Um, and maybe it's a little intangible, this sort of thread. Um, I mean, I, I show a lot of painting and maybe that's one thing, but it, uh, it's this sort of uh, everything between the shows that gets really exciting for me. Um, I show a lot of artists outside of New York and ones that are having their first shows in New York, um, but maybe have established bases elsewhere in Germany and Paris. Uh, so putting artists, you know, in dialogue that maybe have never been in the same state and same space, that's for me really exciting. Um, so it's, I, you know, I, I'm kind of excited to, to stay nimble uh, and a little flexible. So I think there are there is a sort of thread through the program, but uh, I like I like when they kind of rub up on on each other a little bit. The shows and you know maybe it doesn't quite click, but sometimes you know there is an obvious kind of connection. Um, so it's always with the the kind of larger picture in mind for me right now. Um, that that's I guess the the program. And what do you think for the individual artists that you represent in terms of the cadence of how often they show and how you layer that in with art fairs or like institutional opportunities when you're in that for both of you in that kind of career building or career management phase for an artist do you have a is there a schedule in mind or not really um i, I su suspect the ideal scenario is we show an artist every two to three years okay. um more times than not that stretches out to like three to four yeah. um and then how it, many being an artist today is and and having some success is uh, very stressful and uh and and i do not envy in, in what way do you think <laughs> well it's, most it's stressful? you know we're we're calling them you know we're doing eight fairs a year so which fairs are you doing right now <laughs> uh well we're about to do the art dealers association okay. fair right and um so you're and we just cut back from freeze in london so it's there's a lot of demands put on the artist and yeah. we need work and we need things you know we need fresh material and you you know you want to do this in the most elegant way in 1982 when you would call an artist and ask them for a work of art for an art fair they would spit on you <laughs> i mean that was like so vulgar today it's understood and very many of our artists will ask us well what fairs would you like me to make work for and do you consider the fair in addition to like if you do a solo booth for an artist at a fair how does that fold into their scheduling or the difference between them having a solo show at the physical gallery location uh tricky <laughs> <laughs> you know we we it, uh, because you know you're managing a lot of egos expectations yeah results. yeah and we're really interested in having as much work as we possibly can get and um and have it be of the same quality yeah so it, it's there's a lot of pressure on the artist lucas i know you had a really successful booth at independent pre-pandemic with lee that kind of kicked things off in a big way and now your current solo show at the physical gallery is with lee too so that's kind of like a two-year trajectory um can you talk a little bit about that experience uh sure my yeah my pace is very different than that um i do maybe five to six shows a year and they run you know one and a half months six weeks uh so a little bit longer a little slower um and I maybe do one fair a year, uh, namely independent in New York, which is down the block for me. It's feasible. Um, and yeah, I showed Lee Rupel in 2019, her first exhibition at the gallery, and then at independent in 2020. Um, and then it's her second show with me now, which is the first time I would show someone for the second time, um, which is a, a, an interesting step for me. So that is a uh, sort of like an example of my uh kind of long-term relationship with an artist and then other ones for the first time um i guess i can give another example i showed this artist zoe blue m from la um and then an independent in 21 and 
uh, that was a, a sort of an example of how I might kind of continue um, working with someone. You know, you have a show, goes well or not, you, then you do the fair. That's just kind of one version. Um, but then otherwise, it's really just show by show. I mean, I'm really kind of ex still just trying to surprise myself, uh, find new artists to, you know, introduce to the program. So it's a bit of a, a dance between between both, building, you know, for uh, a longer term commitment and then also still looking for new stuff. So one of the other um, items that I was looking at was uh, commissioned work. So obviously when you're having fairs and solo shows and different exhibitions, you're working with your artists to determine what they'll show, how, how when, and where. Um, but as you build up a collector base, um, how do you handle commissions when they come up? And I also think this kind of comes into the legal side of things, of the difference between uh, like commissioned work versus someone buying an existing piece. And how do the terms vary? I guess you could start with the legal side of things and then lead into you know, the different degrees on the gallery side that you've dealt with commissioned work versus selling existing work. Sure, so just to take a step back, I view my role as to memorialize the agreement that the gallery and the artists have hopefully come together and uh, discussed and see eye to eye. And I'm hopeful that when I put pen to paper, there are no surprises, because if there are surprises, that means what either the artist or the gallery is telling me is different from what the other side understands. So again, it's really about transparency. There are different financial arrangements, in my experience, between commissioned works and consigned works. And you know, I think the folks to my right can speak to that. Um, from their experience. Also, but, I was thinking in terms of when a collector commissions a specific piece, is that something that you engage in, don't engage in, encourage, don't encourage, and what are the terms in that situation versus when someone is you know, pre-purchasing something from a, a show? Sure, so yeah, so there's situations where the gallery can commission works, there's situations where collectors can commission works. Um, sometimes it depends on who's paying the cost of the materials and the cost of the production in terms of what that commission relation uh, arrangement looks like for what the gallery is taking. Um, and I don't know if you wanna speak to that a little <laughs> But, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Well, I guess, yeah, we... Um, so I guess it folds into institutional collecting too, or? Sure, yeah. and, and uh, a, a big goal of ours is to get a museum to commission an artist to make a work for an exhibition. Um, oftentimes, it's not with a commitment to purchase it, but it is with the understanding that they will pay for the fabrication. And typically, what we do is we have a, an agreement whereby in three to four years if we sell the work to another party the museum gets that money the fabrication money back so for um for the museum it's great because they then get to recycle the the proceeds and turn it into some other project and for us it's great because we get to have our artists make a new work and you know and, and that's what we're in the business to do is to create those kind of opportunities um, I, I have been privy to um, many years of working with Jeff Koons and um, those were some of the most uh, unbelievably bizarre terms and contracts and you know this was before he went to Gagosian and we were signing contracts where we had no idea how much it cost to produce the work which was insane <laughs> <laughs> and so we got ourselves and I was working for other dealers at the time but um, so I I understand the the complexity and the need for total clarity Exactly, because you can say, oh yes, we'll pay the fabrication cost till they're <laughs> seven figures. <laughs> well, or then when the artist doesn't approve the object that's been fabricated. Exactly. <laughs> the revisions budget. <laughs> um, made me think of a particular case. Uh, so another sort of topic that was on the list of some of the questions were um, importance of, I think this is probably in the beginning stages, importance of written versus oral contracts, benefit of registering copyrights, 
fair use and appropriation in art? Have you dealt with cases? You know, I worked with um, and Jamie and Giuliano Villani and O'Flaherty's over the summer to do all the press on the massive uh, Patriot group show that she did. And her work uses a, a ton of appropriated imagery. And so when you, when Karen, you mentioned that, you know, it sort of brought to mind in other cases, I'm sure that you've dealt with directly, just artists who intentionally use a lot of internet appropriated imagery and are layering that throughout their work and interpreting it. Right, so this comes up for our artists, clients, this comes up for our documentary filmmaker clients. Um, and uh, there's a really important case actually in front of the Supreme Court right now involving a the print series by Warhol and the fair uh, the Supreme Court for the first time in I think over 20 years is really taking a hard look at fair use as it applies to visual art. Um, not to get too much into <laughs> legal weeds for this audience, but the appeal, the federal appeals court of the Second Circuit reversed a decision and held that Warhol's prints um, infringed the rights of the photographer who had supplied the artist reference photo for this uh, silk screen of Prince that was run in, in Vanity Fair in, after Prince passed away. And the, que the question that the Supreme Court is looking at is what is transformative? What do you, as an appropriation artist, how different or does either the visual or the meaning and message of the work, sort of what matters, and why I think a lot of people in the art community are concerned is to find that a Warhol was infringing is really um, has massive implications, has massive implications for a lot of things hanging in a lot of different museums. Um, it's not the first time that a piece of art by a major artist has been held to be infringing, but I think many people for many years thought Warhol was sort of beyond and untouchable. Um, and I, so I think this is very concerning. I think a lot of us, myself, are included that the Supreme Court's gonna come in and create some clarity because I think without that clarity, there's concerns from galleries, there's concerns from museums, there's concerns from collectors. And I, I say all of this with the caveat that a Maryland was sold during this whole thing at either Sotheby's or Christie's for the highest price ever. So I'm not sure that that will implicate the price of, of the Warhol, if any of you are lucky enough to have one hanging. Well, there are several in the lobby of 11 Howard. So I, from, think, I think those are safe. So on your way out, you can check them out in person from exactly. Amy Rosen's collection. Um, but I think, but sort of back to the earlier point, which is totally unrelated about written versus oral and something right. that we spoke about. I think that when you're new in the business and you're really excited and you're just breaking in and you don't wanna step on toes and you can have these oral agreements, I think it's really exciting, but I think then what happens when things don't go as planned? And I think it's always in everybody's best interest to have some sort of written document that lays out an understanding. And although it might feel uncomfortable and although it might feel like why do we need to get lawyers and people like me involved? I think that when things are going great, they're going great and then things can take a turn and then you have nothing to fall back on to evidence what you understood the relationship to be. I think it also sets the tone for the working relationship. I think a good contract can make the terms of the working relationship mutually agreed upon up front. So there's a lot less confusion later because everybody is offering, operating off of the same baseline and those terms are articulated so i love a good contract <laughs> and it's a professional relationship and i think it's you know take pride in, in entering this really really important relationship so but uh, it, it's fair to say that that um, document is as simple as a consignment agreement yes yeah, 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 yeah. and so it, it doesn't need to be some cumbersome legal tome yeah. you know it's really pretty I standard yeah. Can we? Can you say in explicit terms what a standard consignment agreement would be? Like, 
just the, what are the basic terms for, for the audience? Um, the artist has the right to know who acquired their work. The, the artist gets, in most cases, 50% of the proceeds. Yeah. There's some um, uh, acknowledgement that there may be a discount, and then there's a discussion as to who would share in that discount. Does, does the artist share in it? Do they not? Um, if there are fabrication costs, how those are treated. How long they have the work. And then the how long they have the work. Yeah, so it's... If there's a number of works, sort of what is, when does the artist get paid? And is there an accounting? Is it done on a monthly? Is it done within the amount of the sale? As you become more established as an artist, you have a right to know who the purchaser is um, before it's being purchased. Um, insurance, who is responsibility and store, how will the works get stored? What happens if the works aren't sold? Is there some sort of extension period? Um, I don't know. All of it. I mean, <laughs> documentation of the work, um, you know, how can the images be distributed online? I mean, it can get super granular, but it's, you know, it's, it's a good way to protect. But I everything. think it's good to item it out because for people who are, you know, perhaps listening or have just graduated with a BFA or an MFA and haven't necessarily experienced their first consignment to a gallery. Um, I think knowing that like explicitly having that list of line items, which to people working in the art world is, is very common practice and standard. It's not something that they necessarily automatically have access to. So, um, and so like also how can the gallery use you in their marketing materials and on their website and your likeness and, the artist always, even after the work is sold, retains the copyright in the work unless it's been assigned. Um, so, you know, reproducing images in the catalogs, that all, there needs to be permission granted to do that. And can they keep it on their archives? And can they use your likeness to promote their gallery separate and apart from the sale of the specifically consigned pieces? I mean, that's all stuff to understand. And then I had also put put together this little example for dealings between galleries when galleries may be consigning work to one another. So I was like, the, if the work has a retail price of 10K, gallery A assigns to gallery B, gallery B sells to the buyer, gallery B keeps 4K and remits 6K to gallery A, gallery A keeps 1K and remits 5K to the artist. And um, but even something like that, I think, again, explicit, but it's sort of like the basics of how if you have a gallery that is in one location or market, you know, I mean, and then they they want to, in a positive way, consign work to a, a gallery in Berlin that can give you a footprint or exposure there that you wouldn't otherwise have, um, I guess. Can you both talk a little bit about how you work collaboratively? I mean, I think for James, you're probably doing eight fairs and having beautiful space on Walker, you're probably retaining more in-house. Um, but do you collaborate with galleries internationally? We do, we do uh, because I, I had my stint in Shanghai and yes. um, in eight years of traveling back and forth was enough. Um, and it just was a lot of hard work. Um, <clears throat> the the benefit of having other collaborators in the form of partner galleries is that there are other people championing the artist. And um, it takes a lot to convince people to, that this is the right thing to buy. And they want to know that there's, it's just not you who's the only person championing the work. And, and that becomes more relevant the higher the price of the work of art. So, um, you know, we're, building confidence and we're giving words to all that art. And, um, and, and um, so that kind of collaboration is hugely important. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> when I'm showing artists often outside of New York, usually I'm working with the galleries directly that I'm consigning from. Um, so all the time and, you know, being strategic about what those partners are can be super beneficial, as you're saying. Um, it's a sort of network that's helping promote the artist, um, even if you're the one that's physically showing the work at that time. Um, so that is constant um, with most of my shows is usually through another party. So to have these terms solid is, 
you know, standard for me. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, there's always this negotiation. I mean, I'm shipping works more than I'd like, and <laughs> it's, uh, you know, how much commission, blah, blah, blah. That, that, that's a real, can be prickly. And, you know, for a small gallery trying to show artists from all over, it's, uh, it's an interesting problem to have when I think a lot of small galleries show, you know, locally. So that's something I'm always kind of coming up against. I think the art world tends to be um, a lot of rugged individualist. And um, a, a client of mine who was sort of a big Fortune 500 businessman, he said, I don't know why you guys just don't merge with each other, <laughs> you know? And because I think we all have our own vision and we all have that kind of compulsion to share our vision of the world. Um, and the, so much of it is a part of the theater of presenting the work and kind of persuading someone that this is the right idea. Um, having a partner gallery just makes them believe that, well, he's not the only idiot who's showing this. It's work. a cosign. It's know, like so, yeah, and it really, it sort of builds confidence. Um, and so it is interesting to me that younger galleries don't collaborate more. Um, it's fascinating to me to watch how previous employers refuse to share their artists. They, they were absolutely, they wanted to sell everything that we had. And what ultimately happened is the market got smaller and smaller and smaller because we ended up knowing every buyer. And whereas if, you know, Leo Caselli Gallery and the 70s and 80s, he had feeder galleries all over America and Europe. And so there were Lichtensteins and Warhols and Wesselmans everywhere. And so when things came up at auction, it wasn't just the people that that gallery knew, it was all these other voices that were fighting for the artist. So. so, so. One of the other thoughts that I had as you were talking about, mentioned a collector of yours is, you know, on the panel we have an art lawyer, we have two gallerists at different stages in the gallery's development. And so the other sort of, I guess, figures in the ecosystem are curators, art advisors, collectors, artists. I think it'd be interesting to hear from you about how you develop your collector base or manage those relationships, what you feel is the benefit or, or not of the art advisor's role in that and then do you typically work with independent curators or are you mostly curating the exhibitions in-house with your sales directors and yourself directly and lucas you can you know you wrote petzl too so you can you can weigh in from that perspective too um i guess i'll start with the curators i have no i will i, I feel like that's my that's your of, role that's at this stage right that's now. your role so it's not um, needed and in terms of advisors, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm totally open to it. I mean, I think advisors can be really great allies. Um, they can be really aggressive in, in uh, helping place works, especially with the emerging artists that I'm dealing with, you know, that there's a, a hungry audience. So it just is being careful in terms of where the work ends up. Uh, and I think you can be, for me, I'm, I'm, you know, very open in terms of who I'm sharing the work with but then yeah i think it's my responsibility to place the work in the best hands possible so um you know it's just being kind of uh i guess cautious for now especially my shows have a limited number of artworks my gallery's super small so you know if i have six paintings to play with it gets very precious um so no i mean it's all it can all really be you know helpful it's just uh being strategic about where these works end up so for us um and we're at different stages in our life <laughs> um uh hiring an independent curator is sort of like going to summer school and it's a tremendous opportunity for me and my staff to think different thoughts because, uh, you know, it gets boring. You have the same ideas, and after 40 years of doing this, I, like, want new energy. So it's been really interesting to be introduced to younger artists that way. Um, and um, the, the issue of advisors is, um, and I'm sure there are advisors out there somewhere, but um, <laughs> uh, they are a kind of necessary part of this ecosystem because, um, 
there are a lot of collectors who have the desire but not the time yeah and so the advisor is you know doing all the legwork that's the good side for the collector the bad side for the dealer is back in the day we used to have really tight relationships with collectors and they were kind of like franchise buyers and many dealers would have this and so you would just have people like you'd have long-term relationships worth and now those are mediated by advisors so you know there's some great advisors and they do incredibly good work and they're very scholarly but it's still it changes do you feel that it's still it's still critical for an artist's career development to have whether there's a number or a handful of collectors that are really deeply invested in their work and that support it continuously or buy a piece from every show or what what do you think a healthy or a great what is your ideal collector relationship oh um sure i mean it's great to have collectors who are really committed to a particular artist and and i can think of a few that have been very loyal to a handful of our artists and that's been wonderful um the most important relationship long term is with the curators because curators <clears throat> move jobs and they they go from one museum to the next so then and then they have friends and they talk to their friends and curators are always looking for new ideas so that tends to be the a really interesting way to platform someone's career the bigger priority and then do you see because you are prioritizing also placement in institutional collections and as you just said these curators museum curators who can sort of spread the word in a in a broader way do you see a lot of Karen this can also be for you agreements between the gallery and collectors where there's a requirement of an institutional giving of the work um, I'm bringing up all the art net news hop topics so you can answer or not answer <laughs> depending on what you think is commonplace or happening currently in the art market how enforceable are those? Um, so, I guess if you're so who it, so I think basically it depends if who I'm, the agreements between depends on who's enforcing because if you're yeah. the agreements between two people and then you're trying to have a third party or a non-party to the agreement do X Y or Z if they're not a party to that agreement you can't but if you bring them in well I know there's some terms like I had a a conversation with another colleague about um, terms having to do with who would enforce limitations on resale of work and that if the like for example the work was sold within a three year or whatever the stipulation window and the artist getting 10 percent um, some galleries will s agree to those terms would it, the question is whether the gallery would agree to foot the legal bill for that or it's the artist's right to do so so they can put those terms in the selling agreement but then the artist is responsible and this i think comes up with more established artists obviously is then responsible for funding the legal pursuit of said commission yeah and i mean again it's a lot of you know we uh, as a lawyer, right, I, I don't really, I view like that question, is it enforceable? This is the idea of what we have. How do we structure it? How do we paper it in a way? Who needs to be a party to the agreement so that we have the best chance that if something happened, we'd be able to enforce it? And that's what we all sort of get together and think about. There's an organization <clears throat> called Fair Chain. Have you heard of it? No. And, um, it, it, it might be the future, we'll see. Um, and they are working on the blockchain. And um, the principle is that uh, when an artist agrees to sell a work through a gallery, the work of art is, uh, there's a smart contract that exists upon that sale. And the, the buyer cannot sell the work of art without transferring the smart contract. So if every artist in the universe agreed to abide by this, it would work. The problem is we're a bunch of in, rugged individualists and, <laughs> and you know some people have an interest to do that. 
um, others would be afraid that they wouldn't sell the work of art because a deal a collector wouldn't want that encumbrance on their work. Um, but I think theoretically every other creative discipline has um, rights, you know, future rights and usage, commission yeah, structure, commissions, and you yeah. can you can contract for restrictions on sale, right? Absent those. I mean, I remember early in my career, one of the biggest litigations I was handling was about the sale of a red Rothko. And there was a collector who, and this is all public, publicly filed litigation, so I'm not speaking out of term, but we had a collector who the works were in her husband's name and they had bequeathed their collection to a certain museum. They hadn't specified the works that would go along, but everyone knew that they had this gorgeous Red Rothko, and it was the time when Red, or I think was the name of the play that was on Broadway. And because of personal situations, she needed to sell certain works, and she sold the Red Rothko with the stipulation that any future resales would be confidential. Um, and then several years later, coinciding with Red coming out on Broadway, what was on the cover of Sotheby's catalog was this going up for sale and, and it violating this provision. And the question is, was it enforceable? Um, and what did that mean? And yeah, so, yeah. And she lost. Um, what ended up happening? What ended up happening, I think, like most litigations, um, it ended up settling. <laughs> settling privately. Yeah. So I have two additional, um, some questions that were submitted that relate to this topic, and, and we can assess if we want to dive into them. So two that were submitted that we didn't cover yet were, uh, how do you view the NFT technology as a means for digitally native artists to enter the art world, and how do you see quote, the art world responding to the digital art renaissance. So that was one question. I'll give you another option. The other, the other question was, do you think an overriding concept or problem to explore in one's work is critical to the creation of a body of work that gains acceptance and recognition in the art world? Which I feel is probably coming out of school, <laughs> one's thinking about that. So which, which one do you want to dive into? <laughs> At any of the panelists at this stage, because then we're going to open it up to questions from the live audience. Well, I just wanted to mention one thing about Fairchain, because it is super interesting. <laughs> Max is, is great, and I still don't totally get it, but I, I believe something is there um, about artist royalty, um, and that I guess the idea is if a work changes hands, it's built into the contract that an artist would get a percentage of the resale. Um, so in principle, I think NFT blockchain technology, not NFTs, excuse me, blockchain technology can really be beneficial, um, but I think it remains to be seen how to kind of attach it to a physical object. That to me is the question. If for NFTs as a digital asset, it's a whole other. It's a whole other thing. I, I, the whole separate I don't, panel. I don't buy it. I mean, I think uh, it's sort of a use case for Ethereum. Um, and that's all I got. I mean, <laughs> I think it's a bit Fair of <laughs> insider trading, so to speak, but uh, I'll leave it there. Um, but, I mean, the resale royalties is, a, I think, a super interesting question. I mean, it's something where U.S. law and European law really, really differ because there are a lot of situations that we know where an artist at the start of their career, a work is sold and then it appreciates greatly in value and under US law, there really isn't a mechanism for artists to realize anything that of that, unlike the um, under in Europe, there there is. And you know, in California, a while back, they had a resale royalties to try and bake that in. And there was several rulings that held that it was preempted by copyright law, and there really hasn't been any traction. But this seems like a non-statutory way to build that in, which is super interesting to me. Yeah, and it's artist-driven, which I think is really the most powerful side of it. Because you know, if you're an artist and the dealer wants to sell your work, 
in theory, the artist has the, the power to say, this is, these are the terms under which my work can be sold. Um, and the collector would have to do that. So, and that's really compelling. Um, but adoption is, you know, 99% of it. So we'll see. So I wanted to open it up to questions from the audience at this stage. Does anyone have a question for the panel? Suzanne, you're in charge of audience micing. <laughs> <clears throat> test, test. Okay. Um, a lot of the discussion was about um, you're both kind of handling more established or mature artists. Um, you specifically mentioned about you know that have to have a kind of a history of work and in institutions and so forth and. And Lucas, you, you, your work is a little bit more fresh. What advice would you give to a starting, starting out our artist with a lot of talent, but it, literally just at the beginning? Where do they start? You know, where do you know? Do they? That's the hardest question, I guess. And I guess it's probably what a lot of people would want to know. Big question. Um, I think more and more there are ways to get your work out there. Um, I mean, I think we're no longer handing off slides to the gallery on 57th Street and you know, Instagram, online. I think there's less and less pressure on seeing works in person, at least to start, um, which maybe sounds slightly unromantic, but I'm constantly looking at artworks online um, and you can find a very broad audience very quickly uh, and uh, I do think people, more and more people are looking at art online. Um, so I think that is not a solution, but it's a, at least an introduction. Um, and I think it's it potentially can be a very quick way to, you know, at least spark something um, in terms of, you know, back to the idea of gallery representation. I think that's like a a longer, you know, Kind of what commitment. happens when it looks good online and it looks so bad in oh, person? All, all, all the time. <laughs> because that's like, you know, a lot of a lot of what Instagram is. I also coming from a PR perspective feel like on so in terms of social media we're in a post algorithm climate. It's really a paid media channel at this point and not that you don't need to have a social media strategy, but I think the idea that you're going to break through on Instagram in the way that people did when Instagram was pre-algorithm no longer exists as an opportunity from a PR and marketing perspective. And so I think one of the things that's like the tactile question for people just coming out of school, because it's consistent that galleries will say, don't solicit or don't reach out, don't send me your work. And then they'll say, it's really about your friend group. But you know, I went to art school and like in graduate school, it was not friendly. So that concept to me, although I did meet my husband there, so um, aside from him, who's wonderful and we're still married, uh, you know, people were not like, kumbaya, let's all go make art together. They were like, I'm gonna be famous and you need to go away. So I have a different perspective at times on that. And I think also there's sometimes this sense coming out of art school that, you know, sometimes in the art world there can be this, um, this bias of like, if you have a day job, you're not serious about your art, but if you don't have a trust fund, you have to have a day job. So it's like, what's the point of entry? Would you recommend for an artist to work in some facet of the art world to learn more about the art world or no? Would you recommend that they follow some other pursuit and then be making the work and trying to develop community and begin showing? Oh, I, I think working in the art world, being a part of that, this universe is essential. And uh, it just, it it gives you the mechanisms and the levers to access um, and you're going to just expose yourself to people who are in that community um, you know over the years i can remember artists that we've worked with who came up in the world by creating their own group exhibitions where they would just you know kind of macgyver a situation where they would put on make it happen yeah and yeah. they would just create collaborative situations and then 
create an opportunity for people to come see the work. So I, I think you, know, you need to be, um, you know, intuitive and ballsy and, you know, kind of believe in yourself. And, and I think to that point, you know, your question about, um, you know, do you need an overriding concept? I, I think there is a tremendous demand on an artist to not just produce one show, but to produce many shows. And as I was saying to someone earlier, we're, uh, you know, I'm in a business where I do the same thing pretty much every day. An artist goes into their studio and they have to create a whole nother reality each show. And that is very, very difficult. So, um, you know, having the kind of rigor of concept helps. Um, having a kind of rationale of why you are making the work is just one more mechanism to allow you to get through those rough patches. I do think, you know, the what you said about putting on shows with your friends and doing things in a more grassroots capacity as opposed to fixating on coming right out of art school and getting signed to a gallery is a very tangible and practical way to go about it. Definitely. I mean, I think for before I had my gallery, I guess maybe when I was still at Wash U and just after, um, I had with my friend Patrick a foam core model um, this big of a gallery and taking pictures of it and photoshopping it and people thought I had a gallery. Um, so, you know, there are ways to kind of just get going uh, and that, you know, you don't need to rely on the kind of gatekeepers right away. Um, apartment galleries, all these things is sort of the starting point. So for sure. Yeah. Let's take, take one more. Going back to what Lucas was saying, what is the protection to the artist when you put your work on the internet? Very little. I don't <laughs> <laughs> can, can you help me with that one? Sure. So, I, I mean, protection in what sense, I guess? Of Ownership. Right. I mean, so to the extent, right, and this is, I mean, a, maybe a little bit of a PR, <laughs> you know, how big of an issue is it as a st emerging artist for someone to copy your work and put it out there that's sort of what you want a little bit um, when you're there, but... Um, you want a degree of recirculation, but that's why press is more beneficial in the sense that it's credited, like having a press feature, you know, in. Uh, an independent outlet or, you know, the New York Times, a very established outlet where you're identified, you're talked about, your work is identified as yours is going to be much more career building, brand building than, you know, something on social. To an extent, social is almost like the vehicle once something is known and then you, the repetition of it is what sort of increases awareness. But without credit, it's nothing. Yeah. It's just infringement with no benefit. So like if someone posts your work and tags and credits you and says, I love this painting by fill in the blank and tags the artist and their image tagged, then that can be a degree of beneficial circulation. But it's especially in so much as that the image then becomes recognizable as attributed to that artist. But if it's, it has to be part of a broader surgery a broader strategy because if it's just circulating unidentified, it doesn't necessarily land. So I guess the answer to my question is, you just have to take the risk that's your career. Yeah, if you're not seen, buy the ticket, take the ride. <laughs> if you're not seen, they, as you say, uh, they don't know who you are. I mean, I think that's a simplification. It's much more complicated in terms of how you fold social media strategy into PR and marketing strategy, as well as like the physicality of the gallery and in-person viewing of the work and marketing tides to, to your exhibitions and art fairs. So it's an oversimplification of that. But I think when you're sort of growing, you kind of, it's a worthwhile risk to a degree. It's like, is no one going to see your work or is someone going to see your work? But can't you <clears throat> set up your own website? I'm an artist. These are my pieces. You can, and, but if, I mean, it's like the internet, you know, anyone can pull anything from anywhere, so. But you, because you've set it up on your own website, is there any, can you legally say this is mine? Yeah. 
So, and I think we spoke a little bit about registering copyrights. I mean, the main, the main um, hammer, I guess I'll call it, for infringement is there's statutory damages that are available under the Copyright Act, um, but those are only available to you if the work is registered. And Supreme Court also recently held that in order to pursue someone for copyright infringement, registration is a prerequisite. Um, so you need, in order to sue, you need the registration and in order to get those statutory damages, the you have to have registered the work when the infringement took place. So those are also reasons where if you are gonna embark on this internet campaign of getting your work out there, that's a situation where registration, I think, would be really beneficial if you have these concerns. Because to what Megan says, yes, you can have it on your website, but I guess unless it's embedded with some sort of watermark, which I'm not sure you would really want to do in that situation anyway, you run the risk of people just putting it out there without attribution to you and then. But I think when you're trying to establish yourself, your head is elsewhere. <laughs> well, exactly. And how do you register a work and what does that look like? And, you know, again, a little plug for Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts is a great organization that's a great public resource because you don't want to, you're not going to come to me and be Right. Karen's not within budget, <laughs> post uh, BFA, MFA. <laughs> um, well, that concludes our panel. Thank you so much to my panelists. Um, and obviously look out for more invites to both in-person and virtual WashU events. We hope that you found the conversation enlightening. And now we'll move to the blonde for cocktails and for you to speak more one-on-one -on -one with the panelists. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Thank you, Megan.